My name is Angela Kabari, and I am the Capacity Development Officer at Making All Voices Count. And uh, Declan spoke a bit about Making All Voices Count, but I'll just see, I'll, I'll talk to you about how that works and where Ushahidi fits into that picture. So, um, when we look at uh, citizens and technology and governance, there's a lot of excitement because people think, you know, finally what the government lacked was a tool to talk to the citizens and the citizens can now communicate and the government can now collate all that data. Like um, Eric said, there's a lot of excitement, but uh, there's not really that much happening in terms of tracking who's talking to who and how they're talking and how effective it is. So making all voices count is, operates in this space. And we do this by finding funding and learning from new ideas that harness the power of innovation and technology to make governments more effective, responsive, and accountable. So how do we do this? This is from a mural in our office in Nairobi, the South to South Lab. And we do this in various stages. So we have the seeding innovation stage where we take good ideas and we try and make, uh, and try and help the innovators on the ground prove their concepts and we find out what works, how it works, when it works and when it doesn't work. We also scale good ideas. So when we have a proven idea, we take it and we replicate it at scale. So this could mean in a different community, in a larger number, in a different country. And if you can see, there's learning going through, uh, learning being fed through the system throughout. And so from the scaling, we have learning going in and the innovation, and then it comes to the evidence and research, and then we highlight that and disseminate it to the world. So that's how Making All Voices Count works. And who are we? Uh, because making all this happen uh, requires quite a number of skill sets. No one organization can do this. So Making All Voices Count is operated by a consortium of three organizations. Number one, we have HIVOS, who is a Dutch grant-making organization and uh, they're the ones who disperse the grants on the ground. The second organization involved in this is Ushahidi, who I will talk about in some detail very soon. And uh, the last piece of the puzzle is the Institute of Development Studies, which is based in the UK at the University of Sussex. And they're the ones who do all our research and learning and disseminate those lessons and uh, try and actually categorically and empirically prove what works and what doesn't in what context. Uh, we're fortunate to be funded by a number of people, uh, namely the DFID, USAID, uh, the Swedish International Development Agency, and the Omidia Network. So, Ushahidi. A lot of you have heard about Ushahidi, and I am assuming most of you are familiar with us, so I won't go too much into detail. But uh, Ushahidi is a Kiswahili word for witness or testimony. And Ushahidi is also the name of the platform that was built to help Kenyans create, collect, and curate data around the election violence in 2007, 2008. There was a disputed election in Kenya and the country just um, went into flames. And the four people who, funded, uh, who founded Ushahidi, uh, Juliana, Eric, David, and Ori, Notice that several of the reports that were, uh, several of the events that were happening were either underreported or completely not reported because there was a media blackout. And so they decided to build Ushahidi and they did it in six days and uh, created this tool where people can report incidents that are happening around them via SMS, via Twitter, via Facebook. And through this tool, you can be able to map what's happening where and when. Since then, uh, our reach has been humbling. We've had over 90,000 Ushahidi deployments. That's 90,000 maps created. And if you average it out, that comes to about 32 maps a day. Uh, we've had over 6 million reports made to Ushahidi deployments. We've had over 17 million people who are reached by the, who are reached by the initiatives that are collecting this data via the maps. So uh, specifically in Asia, where has Ushahidi been uh, deployed? So Ushahidi has been deployed in Nepal. Um, I think Dr. Nama did an ad admirable job of talking about uh, KLL and the work they've done there. So I will not go <laughs> on and on again. But um, this, it, this was one of the situations where QuakeMap 
was used to actually disseminate aid and collect reports from where we need, where people on the ground need support, and the agencies were able to give that support, and then mark it as done. So it's a fantastic triage tool. Another context in which uh, Ushahidi has been used in Asia is in the Philippines after Typhoon Haiyan. So there was um, the Typhoon Haiyan map created, and a lot of reports were collected and aid was disseminated to the people on the ground who needed help. So where does making all voices count come into all this? So specifically in the Philippines, we have funded 17 projects and of those 14 are still ongoing. And the grants we give to the projects in the Philippines are wide ranging. We have projects in open data. We have projects in uh, resilience to natural disasters. We have those uh, strengthening participatory budgeting. We've even provided funding to set up a hub, um, which is HiFi, the hub for in innovation for inclusion, uh, which is set up at Benild, you know, um, the Benild College. And uh, specifically, I'll talk about two of um, our projects just out of the 17 that we have. And uh, the Selena's cross mapping uh, for resiliency, which aims to create a platform where everyone can collect the data and then uh, from there be able to disseminate that data when it's needed, where it's needed to the people who need it so that everyone is working together and we can stop the replication of efforts that go on. So they've had a number of mapping parties in the Philippines <laughs> And they're doing a superb job of, create, of uh, collecting and curating this data. A second project that we have is uh, from the Center of Preparedness, uh, Center for Disaster Preparedness. And uh, this is a government agency, and it's a regional resource center. And it's the point of this project, it's a research project, is to evaluate how governments are responding to their citizens and how the citizens rate that response. Because a lot of times aid just goes out, but you never find out did the people who were in need get the kind of help they needed when they needed it. So this project in the wake of Typhoon Haiyan is actually exploring that and finding out what community mechanisms worked best um, and assess this to find out how effective they are. And then also look at communication tools that can enable the citizens to be able to rate their governments and to be able to uh, give feedback that this is what we need and this is what we don't need and this is how you can best help us. So from my perspective, I do capacity development for the Making All Voices Count program. And that's why I'm in this panel and I'd like to talk about um, locally as organizations, what skills can you build so that you can improve the resilience of communities. So the first organizational skill I would like to talk about is organizational development. This is the organizations on the ground getting their house in order, setting up the necessary systems and structures and processes and getting the right people in place so that you can make sure your organization is well run. A lot of times our organizations run on passion and are fueled by the desire you have to make change. But that change can't be long lasting if it dies with you. So we need to move away from situations where organizations are dying with their funders and to situations where we have resilience organizations that are long term and more effective because they have everything they need in place. The second skill is what um, uh, Serena talked about this morning, government engagement. No organization will succeed without influencing policy, and in order to do that, you need to have a strong relationship with government actors. You need to understand the constraints faced by government. You need to understand the circumstances in which government officials are working. You need to understand who is responsible for what at all levels, from the national to the very barangay level. And anyone who's ever tried to do this knows that it takes time. So patience is also a soft skill that you need to have because change is not going to happen overnight. A third skill that is required is stakeholder engagement. There are very mov uh, many moving parts in disaster resilience. And in order for you to be effective, you have to build mutually beneficial and mutually respectful relationships with all the people who are involved. And this is your target communities. These are the people who are spread out all over the place. These are the indigenous people and civil society. So you need to build relationships with all these people. 
uh, the next useful ability for you to have is technology. Um, Eric and Andrew have talked about this. But a lot of times people think technology is the solution. Once we have the tech, everything falls into place. And at Ushahidi, we like to say technology is only 10% of the solution. Everything else comes from the relationships that you have in that space. So you need to be able to incorporate various things like GIS and mapping. You need to enhance your data collection. And more importantly, you need to analyze this data and be able to visualize it and draw insights from it. This will enable your organization to make data-driven decisions that are actually based on evidence. Another skill required is the legal and um, regulatory framework knowledge. You need to know what's, what's happening, what's allowed, what is culturally acceptable in, where, in the places that you're working in, and ensure that your programs conform to this legal environment, or you'll find yourself getting shut down very quickly. Uh, the last skill is monitoring evaluation and learning. A lot of times, you're fueled by your desire to innovate and your passion, and you forget that um, monitoring and evaluation is a very useful tool to help you learn and to help you grow. A lot of times, organizations do it just because it's a donor requirement and you want to ch check that box. But we at MAVC look at learning as key to all the work that we do. And from learning, we hope that we can stop people from making the same mistakes over and over again and move to a stage where we're all making brand new mistakes because we know what works and we know what doesn't work. The next set of skills I'll talk about are both organizational and personal. And we'll start with communication. A lot of times people think communication is about spreading your message and shouting as loudly as you can so that you can rise above the noise and become some signal. But often communication, the most important and overlooked part of it, is understanding and listening to the people that you're talking to. That you're talking to. So you need to know what's happening in their space and their perspective. Another set of skills is creativity, improvisation, adaptability. This enables you to make an organization that is flexible enough to respond well in moments of crisis. And we all know that the only thing that's constant in this 21st century is change. Another skill that you need is empathy. You need to put yourself in the situation of the people you're trying to work with and not see yourself as a superman who's swooping in to save the day, but actually understand what their needs are, what they want, and how they want it. You also need to treat your stakeholders with honesty and integrity. You can't assume that just because you're doing good that no one is going to question you or look into your efforts. And the last thing you, um, you can consider is indigenous knowledge. I've been doing quite a bit of reading and it's impressive how communities have been able to build resilience and minimize loss of life. This has happened in the 2004 um, the, the 2004 um, tsunami that hit Asia. This has also happened locally in the Philippines. We have um, communities that are using the bamboo instruments, the kanungong, to raise awareness and create disaster alerts. So uh, these are some of the skills that Making All Voices Count tries to help our grantees and our organizations create. And I hope all of you can also embrace them in the areas that you're working in. Thank you. Thank you.